Welcome to the Draw Shops Get Genius Podcast, where we talk to today's business influencers to pick their brain and pull out their genius. It's time to get genius. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another Get Genius Podcast. Today, we are talking to Jeremy Ryan Slate. I hadn't met Jeremy before this interview, and I'm so glad that I did. We we were connected and uh, I knew he had to be on the show. He's got a podcast himself called Create Your Own Life. And it's interesting because he he didn't know in the beginning whether he was an entrepreneur or not. And he didn't have that, you know, typical story that entrepreneurs usually tell. I had my own lemonade stand. I had this, I had that. And then I created this empire. He, he did have his own uh, newspaper route, but where he went after that and how he created the life that he wants is, is pretty cool. And I think a lot of people will relate to it. He also has a media company that helps people get featured in media so they can share their story with their audience. If they're having difficulty doing that, which surprisingly a lot of entrepreneurs actually do when they have to tell their own story, they can, uh, his company can coach you into finding what that is and why it's important to you. He's got a really cool background. He works with his beautiful wife and uh, we talk about that as well, how to, how to mix marriage and business together. We talk about cold showers, 10 minute cold showers and why they're good for you. We talk about all kinds of good stuff, like thinking big, how it's an asset, how it can also be a flaw and really ultimately what's the reason we're all doing what we're doing. We have a great time. We may get a little deep. We also laugh, but I think you're really going to enjoy it. Hello, Jeremy, and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, stoked to be here and provide some value for your audience. Yes, and I, I know that you will. You have you have a pretty awesome story um, leading into what you're doing today, which is um, your podcast, Create Your Own Life. You've got a production company, a media company. You're doing all kinds of crazy cool things. And you do offer tremendous value with your with your podcast on on a variety of different things. I'd love for our guests to hear how how this all came about. You know where you, where you started as as a young Jeremy and how wow. you evolved into, into this. And you've got two minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to hit the way back machine on that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some of those some of those highlights that you know really brought you to, to, to really want to do what you're doing? You know, how, how did you come to the place of going, Hey, I want to help entrepreneurs and, and people create their own life. It's funny because I didn't think I was an entrepreneur for the longest time. It wasn't something that I, I realized right away. I actually got a newspaper route at like 11. And it's funny because I feel like everybody has this, this story of when they're a crazy entrepreneur about like the things they did when they were a kid. And I actually have one of those. And then I kind of like denied it and went uh, back to the more traditional route. But I had a newspaper route as a kid and I had it for like six years, 250 customers. And I was doing pretty well as, you know, between 11 and 17 year old. And from there, I kind of went the traditional route. And, uh, Studied world religions at Seton Hall University, um, and in between undergrad and grad school, I studied literature at Oxford University, and then got my master's in ancient history. And it's like, kind of go figure. How the heck do you get to where you know things are now? And I had run a little personal training business and kind of the back end of everything, so I'd always had my hand into things there, and I'd always been somebody very into fitness. And when I got out of school in 2011, um, as we know, the economy just was not great. Things weren't really in good shape. So I had been doing this to make some money along with painting houses. So I was working about 18 hours a day coming out of coming out of grad school. And uh, I had that piece of paper and I was going to live the American dream, I thought, at that point in time. And then I, I couldn't find work. Um, the original plan was to, after grad school, go in and get my Ph.D. and teach college level. But so many people being out of work, there were a ton of PhDs out there. So I just didn't really fake, feel like uh, taking on more debt at that point in time. And it kind of took brought me to this point where, you know, I had done all this education. It was going to lead up to something. And then I didn't really opt into the last part, which would have finished it off. So I got out with this master's degree in history. And you really can't do anything with that um, except, you know, feel really smart and speak Latin. So I, I ended up actually you know, personal training for a while after that. And I ran into a priest friend of my family's and uh, got a opportunity to start teaching history in 
a private school. So I was teaching high school, sophomores and juniors. And I was like, all right, man, this is this is where I want to be. This is what I'm going to want to do. I get there and I had no teaching background, no training because in New Jersey for a private school, you don't really need any kind of training. They just say good luck and they stick you in a room with 40 kids. And, you know, within about two years, I was so miserably burnt out and just hated my life. Um, and I was kind of like, well, dude, what, what do I do now? And um, the beginning of that last year, which was 2013, my mom had actually had a stroke. So um, my fiance and I at the time and my father it was like kind of a really big crushing thing for us because she was one of the most the strongest people in my life. And, um, you know, I kind of lost that and it really made me look at mortality and life and kind of the way like, wow, you know, like, wh what am I going to do? And it's, it's funny because when I was 19, I had had a near death experience myself where I had was playing football, tore a bunch of ligaments in my knee and was supposed to have this like really easy surgery, um, you know, the Tom Brady style with the, uh, with the, uh, cadaver ligaments and, uh, my lung actually collapsed, um, and my other one overexpanded and I actually got last rites. And the funny thing is it didn't really sink in and make me think about anything until this later experience happened with my mom. And it kind of really made me look at mortality. And at that point in time, then in 2013, my wife was approached uh, with a network marketing opportunity, which I had never seen it before. I didn't know what it was. So I, I saw this video and I was like, dude, I'm going to make like a million bucks in like two weeks. This is incredible. So <laughs> needless to say, that didn't happen. Um, but it was enough for me to see an opportunity and jump into it and say, all right, well, here's something else I can do. And I did decently well. I, I made some pretty good money. Um, but the problem was I couldn't emotionally handle the number of people that I was bringing on that were falling off because they just wouldn't go to the levels that I would go to to be successful. So it was tough. And I kind of went from there to trying some different things because it just, in my mind, wasn't sustainable if I didn't ethically feel good about what I was doing. So I sold life insurance. I sold products on Amazon. I ended up working for a friend's marketing and branding firm, writing copy and building websites. And then finally from there, actually, ended up starting to create your own life. So it's like a bunch of disjoined things that kind of fit together, but have actually made me the person I am today. Wow. <laughs> been a lot, but that's, but that's kind of how it goes, right? You know, you're, you're yeah. figure out this, you know, where, where do I feel some fulfillment? <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's not always coming from where we think it's going to come from. You know, it's, it's, I think we need more life experience sometimes. Absolutely. So how did your, how did you, you have a podcast called create your own life Yeah. and you have, really, really awesome guests on there offering like so many different pieces of advice related to business, related to health and fitness, um, crowdfunding, like there's just such a range, which is awesome. And I, I dig it. How did you, how did you put that together? Well, it's funny because I actually had started another podcast, um, mid 2015 and it was probably the most atrocious thing ever produced by a human. It just, it just was so bad. And I had looked at myself as the, as the expert and I, at that point in time, I didn't really feel like I was an expert at anything and I was trying to provide that value. And the, the graphic design looked like it was done by a, a third grader. It was like so bad. Um, so I, I had actually taken a shot at it and failed. And I think that's, that's kind of what it goes back to is being willing to take a shot at it. So I, I tried it, it just didn't really work for me, but I had always been a podcast listener. And then in September of that year, I had gotten married and I was kind of like, all right, man, well, you're working part time for a graphic design and branding firm. What does the future even look like for you with, you know, this advanced degree you're not using and everything else? I'm like, okay, well, let's go back to the podcast world. So I actually took a course, um, two different courses. I took the first one by a guy named Steve Cherubino, and it was a cool course, but it was one of the most complicated things I've ever taken in my life, and it kind of left me feeling like, uh, what am I going to do? So I actually took a second course um, called The Podcast Blueprint by uh, Andrew Farabee from the Knowledge for Men podcast, which was super, super helpful, and it helped me put it all together. And from there, I acted more like a professional, which is the big difference than the first time I did it. And I also made a big goal of who I wanted to talk to. So I made a spreadsheet of the top 100 people I most admired and started brainstorming how I was going to seek a lot of these people out. And I spent about eight hours writing individual emails and getting responses and actually talking to people that I thought wouldn't give me the time of day. Even the ones that said no were so nice. Like Seth Godin, even though he said no, was such a gracious and nice person. So I was kind of like, wow, these people that I thought was totally, were totally unreachable are actually super reachable. And it was because I really took that time and showed them why they mattered to me and 
how I was trying to create something to help people that I was actually get a lot, able to get a lot of them to buy into what I was doing, which was incredible. And I, I think that initial idea of thinking big and acting more like professional made everything work very quickly and very easily and, and helped me to get a lot of those big name guests. And, and what's like, what would you say the common theme behind the podcast, behind the create your own life kind of movement? What is the, what is the theme or the um, end goal? It's really funny because I didn't originally like it came from me from a feeling like after I quit my job teaching um, my father thought it was insane. He's like, what are you doing? You just spent, you know, how many how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this degree? You know, he was somebody he barely graduated high school and didn't go to college and then actually taught himself how to be an engineer like I'm that's impressive um, and moved up to the vice president of his company He's doing very well now. So his thing was you get to one place you sit there for 40 years and then you retire and, you know, we both know in, in that, you know, the current climate of business, that's just not going to happen anywhere anymore. And he said to me, well, you know, what are you thinking? I said, well, dad, I want to create my own life. So it kind of like started there from the idea of, you know, I wanted to do something on my own terms, but I wasn't really for the longest time able to put voice to what that meant. I just kind of put it together and the audience started building. And as that happened, I really started um, to segment more of what I was doing. And so, so the show I'm talking mainly to millennials, which is anywhere from 25 to 35, somewhere around there. And I'm helping them to figure out what their purpose is and what they want to do. Because for me, it was I was living someone else's purpose of wanting to be a teacher and doing all these different things and not being who I really want to be. So I want to help people by interviewing experts and figure it out. Because the big thing I, I – hit me that at that, that point in time was I felt like society lied to me. They said, go out and get this great job and get this college degree and you're going to have all this money and you're going to have the security and all this stuff. And it's, it's a sham. So, so that was kind of the point behind create your own life. I want to empower people to create their only security, which is in themselves. You know, your only security is in your own yourself and your own skill set because anything else can change. It's about having, being able to be cause over your own life. Exactly. So, one thing that, that I often think about, and, and I think it started with uh, watching an interview that Simon Sinek did talking about millennials. I don't know if you saw that. I, I didn't, but I am a huge fan of everything Simon's done. Me too. He's, he's incredible. And, you know, he was talking about there's kind of this, there's kind of this fine line on, you know, you want to have this, this amazing life and you want to be happy in all that you're doing. And he was saying how, you know, a lot of millennials today, you know, they've buy into all of that, believe in it, and it's true, but then at the same time, quit early on something because they're uncomfortable and because they're not feeling fulfilled in that moment. So it's almost like, you know, you've got to focus more on the vision of where you want to go and know that you're going to have some uncomfortable times in between. So I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts on that, because there's, you know, a lot of the way that our world is evolving and there's a lot of um, leaders and influencers, you know, that really, really um, encourage this this life that's that's fulfilling. Well, I, I, I totally got to agree with you there because like I, I can tell you where it comes from, too. Like like it's 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 a long time in process. You know, World War Two was the greatest generation that this country has seen. And then they ha they came back from the war and the baby boomer generation happened. They they, they were spoiled. Then they spoiled their children that spoiled their children. Here we are today, millennials. We have been spoiled generation after generation. And, you know, we do want something different. And we do see what our parents' generation was doing isn't working. But I think, like you're saying, it is the whole idea of staying on task and moving forward. And I think that's something that people just frankly suck at. And that's why I think that voices like people like Grant Cardone or like um, Cal Newport, which has an amazing way of talking about it, because I think like – it's important for us to have purpose, but too many times we're saying, oh, this doesn't fit my purpose, so I'm not going to do anything at all. And, and that's, that's no way to do it either because you still have to contribute to society and be a part of society and create something or there's really no point in being here other than just chilling. And Cal Newport talks about this whole idea of you know, following your passion because all of us are like, oh, I'm not passionate about this. I'm not passionate about that. I'm going to follow my passion. And he's like, well, that's really bad advice. You know, the – Best advice is to find something you're good at, become the best at it, and then become passionate about it. Because once you're so darn good at something, you can really get passionate about it. And I think it goes back to the whole idea of 
Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. You know, it's, it's about getting to that skill level where something becomes so easy because that's when it starts to get fun. So they have to be able to stick it out and be willing to put in the time to, to be able to get to that point in time. And honestly, I, I think things are improving, but I think it's been a problem for probably the last 50 years overall, just kind of a sliding scale as we're all going downhill. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, and I'm totally with you. I, I agree 100%. So what is it that, that you, as as an entrepreneur, creating your, your own life, what is it that's most important to you? And, and like, what are those what are those reminders for yourself whenever, because, you know, that's just the nature of life. There's ups and downs, and that's all part of the ride and the journey and the fulfillment, you know? Yeah. What is it that, that you remind yourself? Wow, that's a deep question. We're, we're getting so meta here. I, I, I feel like for me, it's understanding – like what success really is, you know what I mean? And and I think that's, we all get lost in this whole like hustle 18 hours a day, go, 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 you know, like Gary Vee and all these guys. And that's important, but also like, what is it all for? And I, and I think that's what we have to really think about. And I, I've kind of learned, especially with a lot of people I've interviewed, that success is getting yourself to a point that you are valuable enough to help other people succeed as well. Um, it's It's the whole idea of, you know, when you're on an airplane and they're doing that talk to you, which most people aren't paying attention to, but they talk about putting the oxygen mask on your face first before the person next to you. Because if you pass out, you're not good to anybody. And that's kind of the point we have to look at. And so for me, it's getting to a point in building something big enough that you know fulfills me, but also allows me to be able to help other people succeed and do well. And I think that's what really revs me up and gets me excited. And I think Honestly, that's why a lot of people are floundering is because they don't have that bigger purpose. And that was something that really had an effect on me a couple years ago is when I was doing all these different things that weren't working, I had a good conversation with a guy named Patrick Walton. And he said to me, this is great. You know, you're doing all this stuff to make money, but what's your purpose? Why are you doing this? And and that kind of goes back to what you're saying with Simon Sinek and starting with why. And I think when we do that and build out everything that we want to do out from why we're doing it, it makes a big difference because too many of us are just flying by the seat of our pants. Like they were either, you know, on one side with two diametrically opposed things of, you know, I need to make all this money or I need to find my purpose. And it's kind of about finding out why we're doing all this, first of all, and then worrying about the rest. Yes. And it makes it even, even through the challenging There's sticking power in that, and that's what I think a lot of people are missing. You know, that it's easy to pull off something when you don't have a reason that's strong enough to keep you doing it. Right, right. So, okay, enough of the deep questions. I'll get. <laughs> it's like conversations with Buddha here. <laughs> um, I want to talk about your. You have a production company. You have a media company. I want to talk about those and, and what you're doing. Yeah, so it, it's kind of shifted just a little bit, like. The, the the first thing that, that started for me um, middle of last year was, was Slate Media Productions where we were producing podcasts for people. Um, I still do that. I still have a couple shows we run, but it's not really the main focus right now because there actually came – one of the services we do out of that actually has become a whole other business um, in itself. And I, I think it's funny how we always think the, the thing that's going to be the main thing isn't. It's one of the ancillary things that we're doing on that. And we were actually, when we produce a podcast for somebody, because we put the whole brand together and everything that, that goes with it, you know, the vision, the imagery, um, and somebody would just show up to do the interviews and we would do the rest. What we were doing when we were released is we would get them on a bunch of other shows to help promote that show. And I was actually out at Thrive uh, in San Diego in uh, November, and I got a good call, a call from one of my good friends that lives in Israel, Daniel Geffen, and he says, I got this great idea. Let's get people on podcasts and coach them how to be great guests as a business. I'm like, well, I'm already doing that. So, so it was kind of like, and, and it's funny because the, the, the media production side of things started with my wife and I, and you know, she's sitting next to me and she goes, that's great. We could really use some help on that. So then we ended up talking to him about that. And that's how getfeatured.com came about this whole idea of, getting people on shows and that's it's funny because even that has become kind of the secondary thing we've become a service in helping people tell their story because i find a lot of entrepreneurs are really 
bad at telling a story that connects with people. And we were talking to somebody about this yesterday where he had a client that all his family and friends didn't know what he did and he'd been doing it for years. And it was kind of this idea of we have to re- tell a story that people can understand and emotionally connect with because we forget we're talking to people. So we help people to put together a compelling story, um, you know, what their messages they want to get out there and also a call to action because if people have a great story but no call to action, then it's not valuable either. So it really helps us to provide value to the guests themselves and also the hosts because we're giving them somebody that's actually going to be a good guest because I've had some guests myself that I'm like, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You got to stop pitching. Let's just talk. And I, and I think that's one of the things that's missing out there. So it, it's, you know, started as more of a matchmaking service. Um, that's still the, the huge portion of what we do and what people pay us for. But we've also added the coaching to that because it's allowed us to help people to really be more value to themselves and also to the shows they're going on. So it's, it's really exciting because we've only been doing this since like November, and um, we, we've got like almost 20 clients now. It's been incredible how fast things have been picking up. That's so awesome. And I would imagine there's like this kind of discovery process that they go through with themselves where they actually kind of realize why they're doing something. <laughs> yeah, well, because we had one guy that has a, has a fitness product and he, he's going through like all these facts and figures about it and my head's spinning a little bit and, you know, I'm, I'm starting to yawn. And I'm like, OK. And then my partner stops me and he says, OK, man, it's great. I'm sure it does all those things, but you're going to lose somebody in the first five minutes. So we sat through. We found out why he was doing it. We found out, you know, all these different things that have been going on with him with, um, you know, having ADD, um, being athletic had actually given him more of a purpose. And he found out through this fitness product, he had enhanced that and he had given himself even more purpose. And that's a compelling story. But all these facts, figures and things like that just aren't compelling and don't connect with people because I think – in the age of social media likes and email marketing and everything else and podcast downloads were all about numbers, numbers, numbers. And those are great, but it's also about realizing that each one of those numbers is a person listening and that's who we have to connect with. Yeah. And, and so often people forget that and they kind of lump everybody into just this, you know, one, whatever blob of an audience. But yeah, you're, you're speaking to individual people. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what we have to remember because that's what we have to communicate to. Yes. Yes. So you, did you say you, you work with your wife? I do actually. Um, <laughs> it's funny cause our paths were so different. She's been in PR for about 10 years and I've been in education for the longest time and somehow we connected together and you know, my wife and I were the, actually started slate media productions together and now she's the third partner at get featured. As I said, that's kind of become more of the focus now. So it's really allowed us to um, we have a great working relationship, so to spend time together and, you know, really work together and have it be, like, totally cool. Well, and, and I didn't even know this or didn't even plan to, to talk about this, but we have, you know, we have a lot of people in our audience and, and people that we've worked with at the Draw Shop that are, that are couples, that are married. So what are some – what are what's some advice that you can give to – because I know there's some people that it just can't work and some people it's – pretty beautiful how it works what's what's your key to making it work so well or your well you gotta you gotta understand first and foremost she's always right no i'm just kidding (laughs) no you know you know what i find it's about it's for you have to understand first of all you have to put time aside to be a couple because if you're always in work mode because you have to create on a relationship and when you you stop creating on a relationship is when it's over so you have to have that first and foremost the second thing is having defined roles because I think a lot of times in you know business with a spouse or in business with anybody, we have everybody wearing every hat in the company and we wonder why there's confusion. It's about finding out you know what's your strength, what are you good at, and having the person do that. Like She's great at dealing with podcasters. She's great at dealing with publications. I am not as great at that as she is. I'm great at storytelling. I'm great at building systems. So it really works in that way. And the third partner is great at sales. So it's really about finding those roles and also having a time that you shut things down. You know, um, yesterday she had just gotten back from a trip to Florida and went and picked her up. And I took the time to take her out to dinner because I hadn't really spent time with her in a couple of weeks. So it was like really just having that time and making the time where the cell phones aren't on. Um, and it's just us just talking and just being there. And I think when you're able to do that, everything else works itself out. But it's also understanding 
that business is business and you got to keep that in business and keep you um, as a relationship outside of that. And I think it's tough for a lot of people and that's why I think it's not going to work for every couple, but it works for us. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of people, it's kind of gets, you know, dinner, they can't help but bring in the business side <laughs> and then all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. You got to be able to shut it off though. And I think exactly, a lot of people Exactly. I think that's so true. What are, what are the most common things that you get asked yourself? Hmm. Get asked in terms of business or in terms of podcasting? Business, being, different being, things. Running a podcast, being an entrepreneur, what are some of the things that people want to know about you? They want to know, number one, how I get so much done. And number it's that's actually because I'm obsessed with what I'm doing. So I spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's also it's also block scheduling. Um, like I'll have dedicated times each day where I'm working on certain things. So like, you know, maybe from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. I'm working on scheduling or 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. I'm working on just content creation. But it's having that block scheduling because a lot of times we get scattered because we're all over the place and we're wondering why we aren't getting anything done. So that would be one of the big things that people ask me. Another thing is like, how do I get the guests that I get? And that's because I'm, you know, tenacious as hell and follow up, follow up, follow up, which I think a lot of people send one email or one phone call or whatever. And they're just like, well, they didn't answer me. Nobody likes me. And it's really about following up. It took me seven months of follow up before I got an interview with Grant Cardone. It's about like being willing to follow up until you get that. And also trying other means. Like I use a, a site called hunter.io that shows me email, um, the emails for a lot of different websites and stuff like that. So I can actually get the decision maker. So it's, it's about, you know, number one, following up and number two, knowing um, how to get to the right person. And we have to be willing to do that. So those are two really big things people ask me. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, another one is content creation. How do I come up with ideas? And I have a really funny method for that because I, t- I write for a ton of different websites. I write a ton of blog content. And what I actually do is I start out listing all the main points I know about a topic. I write those first. And then I write an introduction to closing and then make sure they all match. And I'm able to write a lot of content that way. Um, by kind of writing it in that method. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. I like that. Well, because if you look on these big sites at a lot of their like main articles, they'll have like listed out bullet points or numbered out points in the middle. And so I realized that's kind of the formula. So I just work it backwards. Yeah. Reverse engineer it. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So I have a question for you. You you were in fitness. You were a fitness trainer. Is that correct? Yeah, for eight years. For eight years, fitness trainer. So of course... My, my question that I'm going to ask you is how, how you stay healthy as an entrepreneur. I know a lot of people today, it's so funny because there's so, there's so much content out there about how to you know, schedule your life. Like you said, do, do some block scheduling, um, make sure you have time for your morning routine, all these different things. And then as entrepreneurs, a lot of us travel a lot. So then suddenly, you know, things kind of have to shift and, and it's not exactly that pretty little ritual that you that you had going for two weeks what do you do to to stay healthy and and stay fit well it's kind of changed a lot because I was obsessive when I was you know 18 19 20 I've, I've been a competitive power lifter for years though I haven't competed in a couple of years um I, I pulled an army tank once which was 80,000 pounds that was fun um <laughs> is that on video it is it's on my youtube channel if you want to look for it <laughs> but um I, I used to work out like two hours a day when all I did was, you know, work out and then work besides that. So it's really changed to that point in time. And it's because fitness was the thing and it was the main thing and it was the only thing. Um, and then as I've gotten older, um, you know, I'm almost 30 now. Um, I've kind of changed it from fitness actually helps me to get my work done. So what I do is I get it out of the way first thing in the morning. And I think one of the things that we're not really good at is we don't listen to our bodies. And I learned to listen to my body and learn what it needs. So I can now get the same out of a workout in 25 minutes that I could in that two hours because I know what are the main things I have to do. Um, it's a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of compound movements, but I know what works for my body and what will make a response. The workout that I do is something called the Max OT, which I don't even know if you can find it anywhere online anymore because I think the company stopped publishing on their website, um, ast-ss.com. Um, but it was a free workout and it was a – you would do four to six reps of your um, maximum weight or 80% maximum weight. And because of that, you don't stop doing reps because you're tired, but because your muscles are overloaded. And I've actually caused a lot of growth that way, which has been great. 
And I've also done the dietary portion of things from Tim Ferriss's four hour body, which has been really big. I've done the slow carb diet for about two years now. And if any, nobody's picked up that book, I totally recommend um, to optimize your fitness. You do that. And there's also, um, after I get back from the gym, there's cold showers involved. I do a 10 minute cold shower because it speeds up your metabolism by about 25%, as well as with that. Now, I don't do the Wim Hof thing, I just do the turn on a podcast really loud and chill. Um, which tends to tends to work um, that or some good music. So I do that for about 10 minutes and it actually helps to get the uh, inflammation out of your joints and your, your muscles and everything too. get the lactic acid moving out so you heal faster because that's also one of the biggest things you're fighting is how fast can you heal and if you're able to do that pretty fast you're able to keep yourself a lot fitter than a lot of people. It's so funny the cold showers keep coming up. My um, business partner and I did uh, the 10 week Wim Hof program so I was just talking about it with uh, some other people the other day about how they do the cold, their ice baths and cold showers, beginning of the shower, end of the shower. It is pretty amazing how how well that works. How shocking is that the first time you do it, by the way? <laughs> it's, it's painful. <laughs> and every second feels like an hour. <laughs> well, here, here's the thing, though, is there's an easy way to doing that. Well, not easy. You know, a lot of my friends have still complained about it. But um, there's, there's an easier way to do that is there's two types of fat in our, in our bodies. There's white fat, which is the stuff we don't like, and brown fat, which is the fat that burns other fat. And it's actually why uh, muscle milk has so much fat in it because it has that type of fat in it. It's called a thermogenic fat. Um, and most of the brown fat is stored on your chest and on your back. So uh, your upper back. So um, what I actually do is I focus the cold water on the um, my upper back, on my traps and my shoulders. And that actually activates it so that it can help burn the other fat. So it's about kind of focusing it in a way that it's a little bit easier. You know, you, you you go numb after about two minutes. So you walk out of the shower and you're like, all right, well, if it hurt, I can't feel it anymore. So so that's an easier way to get through it. Um, though, like I said, a lot of my friends have still complained. <laughs> so you do it. You do it where you just end the shower and that's it. I've done it where you you do the cold shower, but then I turn the hot water on. Well, I start I start with warm, you know, kind of get my get all soaked up and cleaned up. And uh, then I move to the cold and you know, you're standing there for a second and you're like, oh my God. And then, you know, once it gets, uh, gets a little bit numb, you're good. And then you just kind of stand there and chill until, uh, until the shower, the timer goes off. I keep a timer outside the shower. Yeah. People think you're crazy. What is he doing in that shower? <laughs> yeah. I've done, I've been there. Like what were those noises you were making? <laughs> well, the, the noise, the noises stop after the fact, the first minute after, after you lose feeling, but you know, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Well, this is awesome. I, I would love to be able to send our guests to follow your podcast, um, head over to your website. Can you tell us the best places to go? Yeah. If you're interested in the media side of things, that's over at getfeatured.com. If you're interested in checking out me, some of what I've written in my podcast, that is over at jeremyryanslate.com. And I'm also uh, on all platforms. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate. And it's a funny reason I do that. I'm not egotistical. Um, there used to be a cowboy actor on the TV show Bonanza named Jeremy Slate. And by using my middle name, I have finally outranked him on Google. <laughs> Congratulations. That's awesome. What's a <laughs> name? Jeremy Ryan Slate. <laughs> so, and, and, and we can find your, your podcast there as well. And of course, you can Google Create Your Own Life. But we will have links to all of this in, in the blog and in our show notes. Jeremy, you're awesome. I'm so excited. We haven't met in in person, but I'm so excited that I got to get to speak with you and share your story with our audience. I love it. I think there's so many like really important takeaways. And one more thing before before we sign off, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit how dreaming big has been your biggest asset and also your biggest flaw. Ooh, I'm a big thinker too, because we have this uh, business group that I meet with on Thursday nights in New Jersey, and you know every time we're talking about our goals and what we want to do, and you know when I was still running a fitness business, people are talking about you know what is the purpose for your business, and they're going around the table they're like, oh, I want to help 10, 15 people. Okay, yeah, that's good. And I'm thinking in my head, oh crap, my goal is too big. I want to make the whole world healthy, and everybody just looks at me and they're like, wow. So it's I've always been a big thinker which is great because it makes me have to work harder and it makes me find the right people to help me do it because that's one of the things I realized early on. I'm never going to accomplish any of these goals on my own. So it, it's kind of looked at that way. But sometimes too, you also back yourself in a corner, which 
I guess doesn't make it a negative either because you have to produce something then. So so for me, I guess thinking big has enabled me to have to take big actions and to have to find the right people in my network just because you can't do it on your own. Beautiful. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. And I hope we get to see you in person soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Thank you for listening to today's Get Genius. You can learn more about The Draw Shop at www.thedrawshop.com, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Your home for kick-butt custom whiteboard marketing videos. Your ideas come to life. Thanks for listening. Please share, comment, and make any suggestions for future genius guests.